Good morning. It's 8.30, Wednesday, April 20th. I'm Desiree Frazier, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, the future of COVID-19 in Mississippi. Then, the Delta home of a civil rights icon earns national recognition. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. April is Financial Literacy Month, and experts are working to educate students across Mississippi about building a strong financial future. MPB's Kobe Vance reports. The Mississippi Council on Economic Education is holding their annual Personal Finance Challenge, where students from across the state gather to compete and learn about economics. Students who rank high in the challenge can receive scholarship funding. But experts like MCEE President Selena Schwartzfeger said the lessons learned could benefit students for the rest of their lives. We want these young people to grow into adults that know how to make good decisions. And even if they don't remember every single detail about what they learned in the classroom, they've learned the importance of making good financial decisions, and they will know where to go to find the answers. Schwartzfeger says this year's graduating senior class will be the first to have mandatory financial literacy instruction. Among the participants in the Personal Finance Challenge is a team from McLaurin High School. Cyber Foundation's teacher, Eric Height, says the mock scenarios help students put their financial education into practice and see real-world applications. These 7th through 12th graders are considered right now financial experts. They're going to give advice to these judges about what's wrong with these scenarios that they're giving. That's the cool thing. And I'm, I'm here with 7th graders. And my seventh graders out there with a plan of how to help this person out of this financial situation they're in. My seventh graders. Financial experts say understanding the core principles of economics can help students earn more money in their lives and stay out of debt. Kobe Vance, MPB News. Coming up, the future of COVID-19 in Mississippi. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. COVID-19 has kicked around the U.S. for long enough with no sign of it going away. It could soon be declared an endemic disease in the country. If you're not exactly sure what that means, well, neither were we, so we asked an expert. Dr. Rambat Rubash is a medical researcher at Hattiesburg Clinic. He speaks with Kobe Vance. The easiest uh, place to start is to talk about an epidemic. An epidemic is essentially when you have a unexpected rise in cases in a geographic region. A pandemic refers to a unexpected rise of cases in multiple regions, so more than one little location. Um, An example of this is when we have an Ebola outbreak in Africa. That is a local epidemic. If it spreads beyond, uh, say, one region or multiple countries, then it can become a pandemic. Endemic refers to a disease that is constant or predictable or expected in a given geographic location. So um, an example of both an uh, endemic and epidemic disease is the flu, where influenza resides in our communities really around the world at a low level, then typically around the fall and the winter, it spikes to epidemic levels. In the case of COVID-19, we went from a disease that never existed before in humans. So it was a localized epidemic initially in Wuhan, China. And then when it spread around the world, it became a pandemic. And now what we're talking about is could this descend, if you will, to an endemic state where it has a constant, predictable, expected presence in our community? It is, I think, important, however, to not miss, I guess, classify the term endemic as something good. So an example of an endemic disease that's still very deadly and one we should actively combat is malaria. In areas such as sub-Saharan Africa, we have 
a constant, predictable, unfortunately, level of mortality from malaria, and that's not a good thing. It's still it's still very de- deadly. If malaria were to skip over and land in Atlanta, Georgia, as it has in in the past, it would then be a pandemic. So far, we've had the pandemic, and it seems like Mississippi has been not on the same schedule all the time as other waves of the disease we've seen in like say like a New York or a California or other countries. What do you think the future could be like for Mississippi as we see an endemic um, where Mississippi might not be on the same pattern of transmission as some of those other areas? Yeah, we have lagged behind, if you will, as a country, some of uh, the other countries that got hit first. So the this pathway went for um, for us from China to Europe, then from Europe to the U.S. And throughout the course of this pandemic, we have traditionally been about three to four weeks behind what's occurred in uh, the U.K. specifically. And then narrowing it down to the U.S., it's been on the coast first, the east and the west, and then it's gotten into middle America and the southeast. And I suspect that that has to do with travel. So you know, the the initial wave from Wuhan to Europe had to do with really a group of travelers that landed in Italy, um, predictably from Wuhan, China. Apparently there is a direct flight and it was um, common for travelers from China to come to Italy at that time. And then we saw it on our coast, um, New York and Los Angeles, I think primarily because those are major hubs for travel, whether it's Los Angeles from Asia or uh, New York from Europe. And I think initially we even saw different strains of the SARS-CoV-2 virus based on that travel. So the European um, version, if you will, was a little bit different than what landed in Los Angeles. And some people speculate that the different mortality rates that those two cities saw initially had to do with the fact that they had slightly different strains. Down here in Mississippi specifically, we tend to get runoff from New Orleans in Florida, our um, most uh, geographically proximal major um, travel sites. And I think that's probably what we'll see as we're starting to see a bit of a spike in the big cities in New York and and Washington, D.C. that may filter down here um, in in short order, usually in a couple of weeks. Lastly, going on in the future, vaccines. How how much are vaccines for the coronavirus going to become part of normal life? That's a good question as well. To be determined is the official answer. If I had to crystal ball project, um, this may wind up being something that is an annual update, kind of like the influenza. Unless we find um, that the rate of mutation is slower. So one of the reasons why we have an annual flu shot is because the influenza virus is a very quick evolver. It mutates and evolves very, very quickly. Traditionally, coronaviruses have not evolved as quickly. I think we have seen lots of variants because so many people in the world have been infected and reinfected, so it's given the virus an opportunity to mutate and evolve. But traditionally, coronaviruses don't evolve as quickly, so it may be a once every couple of years or every three years, depending on how quickly the variants evade our previous vaccinations. But it will likely be a recurring vaccination going forward. Before I let you go, is there anything else we haven't touched on that you'd like to share with Mississippians? I I think uh, the key is to learn a bit of that vocabulary. Um, We have all become somewhat uh, epidemiologists and infectious disease experts over the course of the past three years or so. And uh, please don't be fooled by the term endemic. Um, That does not mean safe. That does not mean we're out of the woods. There's a difference between um, flipping the off switch on COVID and entering the endemic state. So um, do what you can to take care of yourself, make the choices and risk calculations that are appropriate for you and your own individual health risks and your community transmission. And, uh, Be prepared. Wear the the mask when appropriate. Get vaccinated if appropriate and boosted and uh, make plans for alternatives if uh, things get worse. 
Dr. Ramba Rubash is a medical researcher at Hattiesburg Clinic. Still ahead, the Delta home of a civil rights icon earns national recognition. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. The property of Unita Blackwell is now listed in the National Register of Historic Places. The late Miss Blackwell was a prominent civil rights activist and in 1976 became the first African-American woman to serve as mayor of a Mississippi town. Her son Jeremiah now oversees her estate. It's been the process ever since. Basically, my mother had died back in 2019, and then I was approached by different people asking what was I going to do with the property and stuff. So what did you think when you heard this? Well, I was ecstatic and pleased because I was um, wanting to do something similar to this to honor my mother and my father. What is it about your mother that made her an icon for Mississippi and the nation now? I guess coming from the humble roots of the Mississippi Delta up in Lula to aspiring to where she is now. She was the first African-American woman to be elected mayor of a city here, Mayorsville. Yes, she incorporated the town. It it was previously here because it was a county seat back in the 1800s, but then she incorporated it in order for her to get things to better the community, where she brought in sewage and roads being paved and other stuff that incorporated the town to where it would get funds and necessary things to make it better for the whole community. And what county are we talking about? It's Sequina County. Is that where you grew up? Yes, ma'am. We moved here after my great-grandmother died. And basically, my father brought us back here to uh, Mississippi. Because I was born in Helena, Arkansas. Being in Mississippi and knowing the history of the state and your mother's efforts to improve her community, what are your thoughts behind that? Um, It's a long way from seeing my parents and the struggle that they had to do from civil rights to this now has paid off and the dividends of uh, helping out not only themselves, but me as well, so as other people in basically the the community and the state and basically worldwide. In what way is it paying off? Well, it brought about a change for everyone as well as especially minorities of all race, creed, and color because of... uh, the statue at the time where it was different than it is today. And this has been the slow progress that Mississippi has made as well. So as this nation, as well, so as this world. As you mentioned, your mother was involved in civil rights. Were you a child at the time? How old are you? I am about to be 65 years old here in July. Uh, Yes. I was a child. And what do you remember about her involvement? Uh, Lots of stuff from uh, going up to the courthouse with her to going on marches with her to basically uh, going to school, getting kicked out of school for wearing a snake button to just growing up in that community. 
Okay, so your mother has three pieces of property on her property, or tw- yeah. or three buildings on her property. Are they exactly what you call them? Because there's a Freedom House, the Ranch House, and the neighbor's shotgun house. Yes, it is. Which because one does she live in? I grew up, and we lived originally in the Freedom House. It's a three-room shack because we didn't have running water, and we didn't have all the comforts. It was just three rooms. It's still originally somewhat standing intact to this day. And it's everything I know because that's my great-grandmother's house that we inherited, and we moved in there when we came here upon her death. What were the conditions in Arkansas? I mean, was this a step back? Did you go, oh, my goodness, or was this what you anticipated? No, basically it was just another home because we it wasn't much better conditions because we lived in what they called greenhouses in Helena, and they were similar to three-room shacks, but they were painted green, ironically. I see. And so the ranch house, what is the ranch house? The ranch house is the house that my mother told my father to move us into because she was tired of us living in that three-room shack as it was basically wearing down due to years and years of it. Plus, she said she wanted me to have running water and a better house. So that she talked my father into it because at that time, see, women couldn't go and just get a home loan. It had to be my father to sign off on the loan. What was the ranch house like? Uh, all the comforts of home. It was, had indoor plumbing and electrical appliances, and it was a way, way step up from previous stove and basically a three-room shack right next door. Okay, so we move on to the shotgun house. Was that on the same property? No, we. she acquired that property uh, from a neighbor because she wanted to keep that and our three-room shack as historical reference i guess she was for thinking about something pertaining to basically what has happened now because she she wanted she said she wanted to remind herself of where she came from as well so as where we've came from and so for the rest of her life she lived in the ranch house on this property that she had acquired over time. Yes, ma'am. The group that initiated this is talking about developing it. How do you feel about that? I'm ecstatic about it because I kind of get the feeling that uh, my parents would be ecstatic and how this would be turned into something that would benefit both our family, knowing their roots, and knowing their history as well so as giving back to the local community, giving back to the state, making it notoriety, and this country is history is a part of it. So you had no desire to keep it for yourself? Well, yes, I still own the property rights. I haven't signed over the property rights, but I am, like, seeing what's the proposition as to how this property can be used for the betterment. Jeremiah Blackwell, we appreciate you taking the time to speak with us about your mother, Unita Blackwell, a civil rights icon in Mississippi and a woman who wasn't afraid to step out and make a difference in the state and in her community. Thank you.
This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Stick around for a full morning of Mississippi Radio. Coming up at 9, it's Fix It 101. Then at 10, it's Everyday Tech. And at 11, don't miss Southern Remedy. Find past installments of this and other Think Radio shows online at mpbonline.org. I'm Desiree Frazier. Join us tomorrow morning at 8.30 for the next Mississippi Edition only on MPB Think Radio. Have a good day.